Well, yesterday I got my first written question. <laughs> it says a beautiful presentation, but what about the five foolish virgins? <laughs> well, remember that this five foolish virgin is part of the parable of the ten virgins. Remember, a parable is a story. It can be a true story or a made-up story. And every story has a, what we call a punchline, a spiritual application. The parable of the ten virgins is found in Matthew 25. There are two questions you, you have to ask for every parable. What is the context that the, in which Jesus gave the parable? And number two, what's the punchline? Well, if you look at Matthew 25 verse 1, you know, to verse 12, you will discover that this parable is in the context of the second coming of Christ and that we should be ready. Okay? The punchline is in verse 12. You know, you remember these five foolish virgins ran out of the oil and they had to go back and find some and they come to the door and knock for, to, be entered, to be let in. Listen to what Jesus says in verse 12. But he answered and said, that is to the five foolish virgins, Assuredly I say to you, I do not know you. What does that tell you? Remember the, in Matthew 7, people will say to Jesus, I cast out devils in your name, I did some wonderful works, and Jesus will say what? Were these converted people? If they were, Jesus would have known them. The sheep know my voice. You know, my lambs know my voice. So obviously, you will find quite often in Jesus' teaching that there are two groups in the, in the church. Wheat and what? Tares. Those walking in darkness and those walking in the light. So please remember, if Jesus doesn't know you, you are... You know, in fact, the parable before that is the parable of the faithful servant and the evil servant. And he calls the evil servant, you hypocrites. You're pretending to be Christian. You're acting like one outwardly. And you have this all through the history of the Christian church. In the book of Acts, every, all the members were one heart and one mind. What they possessed, they sold and laid the money to the disciples' feet and was given to those who needed it. Chapter 5 of Acts, you have Ananias and Sapphira. What happened to them? They lied. They were pretending to be believers, but they were not converted. So I question whether the five village virgins had ever experienced the Zoe life of Christ. They were members of the church, but they were like tares. So you must always look at the punchline to find out the significance of a parable. Okay, now, as a church, as an Adventist church, we have some unique doctrines. And one of them, I don't remember the number, but one of them is called the Great Controversy. And this fundamental belief is unique to Adventism. And it, is so, it was so important to Ellen G. White that she wrote five books on this one issue. It's called the Conflict of the Ages. Patriots and prophets, prophets and kings, desire of ages, uh, acts of the apostles, and of course the great controversy. Now, if those of you who possess it, look at the very first paragraph of the first book, Patriots and Prophets. I think it's page 33, where she will say that God is love. His nature, everything about him is what? Love. And then the very last paragraph of the very last book, great controversy, the very last paragraph, she goes on to say that all things have been clear, all things are animate and inanimate, all declare that God is what? Love. Between those two statements, you have the great controversy between Christ and Satan. And Satan has tried to pre present a very negative picture about God. And many fall for it. So today we are going to look at the cross as how it exposed Satan as a murderer of our Savior. Let me put it this way. 
Since Lucifer became Satan, he also became a liar and a deceiver. And we are told in the last days that he will appear like an angel of light to deceive, if possible, the very elect. That is why it is extremely important that we understand the true colors, the true nature of this enemy of souls. So this morning we are going to look at the cross, at how it exposed Satan. Okay, so if you have your Bibles, please turn to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. And Jesus there makes an amazing statement. He's talking to the Jews who claimed to be God's covenant people. Okay? He's claiming, talking to people who claim to be God's covenant people. And this is what he says in verse 44 of chapter 8. John chapter 8, verse 44. You are of your father, the devil. Now, how would you like if Christ would address us who claim to be the remnant? You are of your father, the devil. And the desire of your father you want to do. He was a what? Murderer from when? From the beginning. And does not stand in the truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. What I want you to look at is that statement Jesus made. He, that is Satan, was a murderer from the what? Beginning of what? Okay, let's look at it. Please turn your Bibles to Ezekiel 28. And there we have a clue as to what Jesus meant. Ezekiel 28. And we look at verse 14 and 15. Ezekiel 28, verse 14 and 15. Speaking about Lucifer, it says, You were the anointed cherub who covers. I establish you. Who's the I? His creator. And who's the creator in the New Testament? Jesus Christ. By him all things were made. You know, John 1 verse 3 and so on. So, Christ established Lucifer on the highest point of a created being. Verse, the second part of verse 14. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. And then verse 15, you were perfect in your ways from the day you were what? So how did God, how did Christ create Lucifer? Perfect. But then he said, till iniquity was found in you. Now iniquity, the Hebrew word means bent. And when used spiritually, it means bent towards self. So Lucifer was created in the image of God, in the nature of agape love, which does not have self in it. But somewhere in his time, I don't, we don't know when, an idea came into his head that completely contradicted God's love. And what was that idea? Well, turn to Isaiah, or Isaiah. And chapter 14 tells us what that iniquity was. Chapter 14, and we'll read verse 12 to 14. Isaiah 14, verse 12 to 14. Speaking about Lucifer. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground. You who weaken the nation. For you have said in your heart. Now please notice. He did not say this publicly. He said it where? Yeah. And you know, the only person who can read your heart is God. So we should stop judging. Because some people are good actors. You have no idea, you know. Let God do the judging. So God is saying, you know, the prophet Isaiah is saying, you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. 
I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the congregation, on the farthest side of the north. I will ascend from above the heights of the cloud. I will be like who? So what was that iniquity? He wanted to take the place of who? God. He wanted to take the place of his creator. Now, is it possible to have two presidents of the United States at the same time? No. So also, in order for Lucifer not become Satan, to take the place of Christ, he had to get rid of him. And Jesus told us in Matthew 5, you know, verse 21, 22, you know, that murder does not begin with an act. Remember the Pharisees would stand up and say, I have not murdered anyone. And Jesus said, one moment, if you hate somebody without a cause, you have already what? Murdered. And so Lucifer developed in his heart a hatred for Christ because he wanted to get rid of him. So when Jesus says he is a murderer from the beginning, he does not mean that Satan or Lucifer become Satan, did the act. It was his desire to get rid of Christ. Now what he told the other angels, I don't know. But obviously he was a very good politician. Because he convinced one third of the angels to take his side. And he felt that this was strong enough to attack Jesus. And so we read in Revelation 12, verse 7 to 9, that there was war in where? Heaven. Between Lucifer and his angels and Michael, which is Christ, and his angels. Who won that war? Jesus did. And what happened to Satan now? He was cast out. Now you may say, why did Jesus not destroy him at that point of time? Because look at what he would have solved all this miserable stuff that we go through. The point is this, that only Jesus could read his heart. If he destroyed Satan at this time, you know what would the result be? People would worship him out of fear. And if you read 1 John chapter 4, verse 16, 17, 18, there is no fear in, in understanding God's love. When you fear God, you have not understood his what? Love. Let me, let, me, let me read the text because you see this is made in the context of the investigative judgment. So 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. In verse 8, John tells us that God is love. That is, that is what he is by very nature. You know? But now in verse 16 of John, 1 John 4, and we have known and believed the love that God has for whom? For us. God is love, and he who abides in love, that is God's love, abides in God and God in him. Now look at verse 17. Love has been perfected among us. That is, our understanding of God's love is perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness when? In the day of judgment. Do you have boldness? Why should we have boldness? Because as he, Christ is, so are we in this world. Isn't that good news? There is, verse 18, there is no fear in what? love. Perfect love, that is a perfect understanding of God's love, cast out what? Fear. Because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. In other words, in the dark ages, you would see these wood carvings of God with a fork, you know, thing, pushing the sinners into the fire. And Satan has created an image of God a God of vengeance, a God of judgment, a God who wants to punish all those who disobey him. And so we have an image of a God that puts fear in us, and that's why God did not destroy Satan in the first place. But there had to come a time 
when Satan's true colors had to be exposed. So what did Satan do when he was cast out? He looked at this earth, brand new earth, with only two people. And he said to himself, if I can get this world, I can develop it and make it a better place than God's universe. Now, could God, could Christ have stopped him from coming to this world? Yes. Did Jesus know that Adam would give in to the temptations of Satan? Then why did he allow him? Well, folks, the only way God can expose to the universe how terrible sin is, is to allow it. Because sin didn't, you know, was a theory. Only God knew how terrible sin is. So Satan comes to this world, he first deceives Eve, and then uses her as a tool to get who? And when he got Adam, he got the whole human race. How do I know? Please turn to Luke chapter 4. The Gospel of Luke chapter 4. And look at the second temptation of Christ in the wilderness. You know there are three temptations? This is the second one. Chapter 4 of the Gospel of Luke Verse 5. Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him what? All the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Now I'm sure Satan knew the computer science long before we discovered it. The kingdom of the world simply means he showed him the entire human race, including the Washingtonians, okay? Because I climbed the highest mountain in Israel, you can barely see Jerusalem. You know? So he showed him all the in the world. Now listen to what he said. Verse 6, And the devil said to him, to Jesus, All this authority, the rulership of the world, of the, all this authority, I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomsoever I wish. In other words, Satan is telling to Christ, you don't have to go to the cross to redeem the world. I can make it easy for you. Just bow down. Of course, Christ never did that. But the, question, the thing is that you need to keep in mind, Jesus never challenged the claim that he made, that the world was delivered to him. In fact, on more than one occasion, Jesus referred to Satan as the ruler of this world. And Paul calls him the God of this world. Let me give an example. Go back to John, chapter 12. John, chapter 12. And Jesus is talking about the cross. Okay? John, chapter 12. Look at verse 31. This is Jesus talking. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the what? Ruler of this world will be cast out. Referring to the cross. So please remember that Satan had the whole world in his hand when Adam sinned. Now, God had two choices. To destroy the world with Satan or redeem it. And so Jesus came here 2,000 years ago to buy us back. That is what the word redeemed is. To buy us back. To redeem us from the clutches of Satan. And he came as a babe in a manger. And you know, Satan knew who that baby was. The Jewish leaders refused to accept that he was the Messiah. Even they told the wise men that he would be born in Bethlehem. And you know what Satan did? He said, he said to himself, I am not going to wait till you grow up. I am going to destroy you right now. And so he sent his agent. Now all of Satan's agents are great men. This guy was called Herod the what? Great. Idi Amin, who tried to destroy Christianity in Uganda, called himself the conqueror of the British Empire and all other titles with him. So he said to Herod, 
Don't undermine that baby. Send your army and kill every baby boy under the age of two so that among those baby boys, you will get the one that I want to kill. Did he succeed? No. He did not succeed. And you can you know, read this in Matthew 2, verse 1 to 16, the whole story. Then in the third temptation of the wilderness, which is Luke 4, 9 to 11, he, said to, he took Jesus to the top of the tower of the temple and he said to jump. Don't worry. The angels will catch you. If somebody took you to the top of a tower and asked you to jump, what do you think was the motive? I call it strawberry jam. You'll be splattered with red all over the floor. Did he succeed? No. Then I want to give you, you know, another experience. Please turn to John, since we're in John chapter 10. John chapter 10. And please look at uh, verse 29, verse 30, 31. John 10. In verse 30, Jesus makes a statement which to the Jews was blasphemy. I and my Father are one. Now look at verse 31. Then the Jews took up what? And what's the next word? So this was not the first time. To stone him. Did they succeed? Why not? You need to know why not. And I'll give you two texts. Since we are in John, I'll give you two, both from John. Turn to chapter 7. John chapter 7. And in verse 29, Jesus makes a statement identifying himself with the Father. But I know him, for I am from him, and he sent me. Therefore they, that is the Jews, sought to take him, that is to stone him, but no one laid a hand on him. Why? Because his hour had not yet come. God had sent Christ on a mission, and until that mission was complete, nobody could touch him. Go to the next chapter, chapter 8, verse 20. Chapter 8, verse 20. These words Jesus spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no one laid hands on him, for his hour had not yet what? Come. So nobody could touch him. And keep this in mind because we're going, we going to apply it to ourselves in a few moments. But if you go to Luke 22, verse 53, Jesus is in Gethsemane, and an angry mob comes and takes him captive. And he says to them, that's Luke 22, verse 50, when I was with you, nobody touched me. But this is your hour and the power of what? Darkness. So the father said to Jesus, I have to remove my protection. The only way I can convince the universe and this world what was in the heart of Lucifer, who became Satan, from the beginning was to allow it to happen. And in Gethsemane, the protection was taken away from Christ. And Satan said, I'm not going to just kill you. I'm going to choose the worst kind of death that man has ever invented, crucifixion. Do you know it takes between three and, ten day, three and seven days to die on a cross? It's a very slow, lingering death. You were always crucified publicly so that everyone passing by could spit at you. Number three, you were always crucified naked. Our artists are very kind by putting a loin around Christ. But no, he was also crucified naked. The big problem when you're crucified is to breathe out. And to do that, you have to lift up your body. And when you do that, there's excruciating pain in every joint of your body. It's unbearable. But because we human beings uh, have a an instinct for survival, we will do it up and down, no matter how painful it is to keep alive. Up and down, up and down, until our bodies are so exhausted that we cannot lift up our bodies and we die. 
three to seven days, depending how strong you are. But if they wanted to kill you, straight away, they would break the legs, the, 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 they would break the, your legs so that you could not lift up. Remember what they did with the two thieves? What did they do? They, break, they broke their legs. When they came to Christ, did they break his legs? Why not? He was already... What killed him? It wasn't the crucifixion, folks. It was our sin. So Satan chose the worst kind of death to destroy his enemy. This is your hour. He heard those words and he said, I'm going to get you, Jesus. You defeated me in heaven, but now you're in my territory. And he tried. You know, Jesus said to his disciples in John 15, verse 18, 19, if the world hates you, it's because it hated me what? First. You see, when Adam sold this world to Satan, it came under his dominion. So Satan's dominion is this world. When Christ came 2,000 years ago, he came to establish his kingdom on this earth. In fact, one of the key messages that uh, John the Baptist pronounced is the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So Christ came to establish his kingdom. So that as a result of what Christ did, there are two kingdoms in this world. Please turn to 1 John. Let me give you an idea. 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. And please notice what it says here. 1 John chapter 5. And you will notice John write, uh, speak, writing to Christians makes this statement in verse 19. 1 John 5, 19. We know, that we believers know, that we are of whom? God. We are of God. And the whole world, that is the unbelieving world, lies under the sway or the authority of of the wicked one. Who's the wicked one? Satan. So the gospel of Christ has split this human race in only two camps. Believers and unbelievers. Sheep and goats. Those who have built their house on the rock Jesus Christ and those on self-righteous, sense of self-righteousness. So folks, when Satan was given the opportunity, he he used the Jews to cry out, crucify him. Now, what was God doing? He was exposing what was in the heart of Lucifer who became Satan for all these sanctuaries until the cross. And when Jesus was hung on the cross, Satan was exposing himself his true colors. And he, he did not stop there. He came to Jesus while he hung on the cross because he's still tempting. He said three times, once by the soldiers, once by the priest, once by the thief on the left hand said, come down and save who? Yourself. So now, going back to John chapter 12 that we just read there are two casting out of Satan the first is physical casting in heaven you know when he fought against Christ the second casting out was at the cross look at chapter 12 of John I read you know verse 31 but I'm going to read now verse 31 32 and 33 now is the judgment of the world now the rule of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw how many people? All people to myself. Now what did Jesus mean by the word now? Look at verse 33. This he said signifying by what death he would die. So the cross is one place which exposed Satan as a murderer of our Savior. On, on, uh, on Friday morning, 
I'm going to look at the other side of the cross where it exposed the love of God for you and for me. But now let's take this truth and apply it, okay? Number one, the, new, the, the metaphor that the New Testament uses for the Christian church, unique to the New Testament, not found, all the other metaphors are found in the Old Testament, but this is unique to the New Testament. The church is the body of what? Christ. He's the head and we are the what? So in a sense, we are an extension of who? Christ. And Jesus said to the, to the disciples, if the world hates you, it's because it hated me what? First. But here's, the, here's something you need to know. If the, your hour has not yet come, nobody can what? Touch you. God is sovereign, folks. He's in charge. Now, I'll give you an example, okay, so that you, you know what I'm talking about. When I first came to Ethiopia as the Minister Secretary of the Union, I discovered that we had a conference, what they call fields there, that had only 430 members. Can you imagine a whole conference? 430 members. So I went to the president and I said, doesn't this bother you? He said, yes, but there's nothing we can do about it. I said, why not? Why can't we hold an effort? Well, this conference, the headquarters, was in the very capital of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. That is where their leader, called the Abuna, similar to the Catholic Pope, you know, he's the leader, he lived there. And he will not allow any denomination to hold an effort. So he's, the president said to me, there's no way we can hold an effort because the Abuna will not allow it. And I said to the president, I said, look, we are an official recognized church. In fact, one of the, the man who loves us Adventists is Haile Selassie. The land for the hospital he gave, the land for the, uh, our college he gave, and you know, he's the lady who was in charge of his house, his palace, was Mrs. Hansen, a Seventh-day Adventist. So I said, why can't we hold an effort? And he said, it's easier said than done. <laughs> so I took that as a challenge, so I said to him, I'm going to hold an effort. And he said to me, I advise you not to. Well, I didn't listen to his advice. I took four of the theology students from our college, plus the nine pastors of that conference, and I went to the governor of Gondel. That is where the headquarters is. It's a big old city. And I said to the governor, who was trained in England, you know, he was a military man, but trained in England, and I said to him, uh, can I rent a hall, that is a school hall, because it was holiday time, to hold my effort? And he said, sure. So I paid him the money, we made an agreement, and... Uh, we decided to begin the effort on a Sunday evening. In the morning, in the Sabbath afternoon, we flooded the city with leaflets, which we made out of, you know, by hand, Gestetner. And then on Sunday morning, we decorated that hall, swept it, put flowers and decorations. And I said to two of my theology students, please wait here and look after this place while the rest of us go to the home that we have rented for lunch, and then I will send the other two and you can come and eat with us. We hardly began eating when these two kids came running and they were crying. I said, what happened? He said, the truck of six soldiers came. They tore our banners, they destroyed everything, and they tried to catch us and beat us up. And I said, who sent them? He said, they said to me, we didn't stop to ask. And you can't blame them. So I thought it was the governor. So I went to the governor and said, what's the meaning of this? You gave us permission. And he said, I didn't send them. It was the Abuna who sent them. The leader of the Orthodox Church. And he said to me, this man has more power in this city than I do. I did not know that you did not get permission from him. So I have made an appointment on Monday to go and see the Abuna to get permission. So I took the president and another, another pastor who's, you know, who could translate for me. And we went, the appointment was at 10 o'clock or 10.30. I forget the exact, but somewhere around the 10 or 10.30. We arrived there, 
And the guard said to us, the Abuna is praying and he will not see you until he finishes. And I said, but we have an appointment at 10.30. Doesn't he know that? He said, it doesn't matter. He will see you when he feels like seeing you. I said, okay. They made us sit on a bench in the sun with no shade and this is 9,000 feet above sea level. And folks, the ultraviolet rays are very strong at that altitude. No cloud cover. It's a blue sky. So we sat there for two and a half hours. And I don't know what he was praying about for two and a half hours. And then we were allowed in. Beautiful red carpet in the palace to his throne made of gold. Up on a platform, you know. And they made us sit on a wooden bench, the three of us. And the Abuna turned around to me and said, what are you doing here? And I said, you'll be glad to know I'm here to preach Jesus Christ, the same Christ you believe in. And he looked at me and said, I want you to know that I'm the spiritual leader of this area. We don't need your help. Please pack up and go home. And home was Addis Ababa, 300 miles away. And I said to him, if I do that, I will be disobeying my boss. And he said, who's your boss? I said, Jesus Christ. He said to go into all the world and preach the word. And this is part of the world. And then he stood up. And I could see anger in his eyes. He said, you better pack up and go or there will be bloodshed. And I said, you find somebody else to scare. And the assistant who was sitting next to him stood up and said, don't take this man's words lightly. He means what he says. And I said, I also mean what I said. And I turned around and I walked away. The president was very unhappy at my response. So I went to the governor and he said, I'm sorry. If he gives you no permission, I have to withdraw my permission. I will pay you back the money. The only place you can hold your effort is in your church which was three miles down the road, on a dirt road. There was no buses there. It was a tin shack, 12 members. Six of them was the, the president and his family. He was the pastor also. And the president turned around to me and said, who will come here? Who will walk three miles to hear you? I said, since when are you a prophet? <laughs> because we decided the next Sunday to begin the effort. And so we produced some more handbills and we flooded the city on Sunday morning. <laughs> Sunday afternoon, there was a loud uh, Land, Lo Land Rover with huge speakers and all over the city, they were shouting something. So I said to the, the, Eng the pastor who spoke English, I said, what are they saying? They're saying this, that anyone who attends this meeting will not be buried in the Christian cemetery, which to them, to the Orthodox Church, meant you are lost. Your disfellowship. Okay? And the president said, you see, nobody will come. I said, look, let's wait and see. Well, there was a university there. And you know, university students sometimes like to be rebellious. And they were sick and tired of being told by the Abuna what they can do and what they cannot do. So out of defiance, not out of interest, out of defiance, 70 of them came to the meeting. <laughs> and, you know, it was just a tin shack. We had to put chairs in the aisles and everywhere, you know. Some of them sat on the floor. Well, they came the first night, they came the second night, they came the third night. And... In the morning, I was studying with the past four pastors and the, uh, the pastors and the four theology students through the book of Romans, my favorite book. And on the fourth day in the morning, one of the universities came running and I could see he was desperate. I said, what's wrong? He says, the, there's a group led by the monks of the Orthodox Church, huge crowd with sticks and stones to kill you all here and burn your church down. And the pastor stood up and said, let's run. One moment I said, it's very mountainous there. I said, how many of you know these mountains? These monks live on the monasteries up in the mountain. They know it inside out. If we die, let us die in God's house. <laughs> and the pastor said, but pastor, we have families. <laughs> and I said, so do I. My dear wife, 300 miles away, did not know what was going on. Until some crazy guy called and told her what was going on. See, there are some things a pastor should not tell his wife. 
because they worry for nothing, you know. And there are some things the wife doesn't tell the, her husband. Anyway, so what happened is this. When this student saw that we were not running, he ran. And I didn't know what he was running for, but I realized later that his father was the chief of police. He ran to his father and told him what was happening. The father got five policemen in the truck with revolvers. They rushed to the church, and when they arrived and stood in front of the church, we saw the crowd coming quite near, shouting. <laughs> and the chief of police, when they reached listening distance, said, one step you take and we'll open fire. You will have to blame for yourself for your death. You have no right to take the law in your own hands. If you have anything against this man, take him to court. So they, guess what they did? They turned around and left. Our hour had not yet what? Come. Well, three days later, I had a sermon to court. And the union discovered that and said, do you want us to send a lawyer? I said, no, I think I can handle this priest, you know. So I went to the court with these two men, the president and my translator, and the courtroom was empty, except for the judge. And the judge happened to be the governor, <laughs> the same guy. <laughs> so I said, where are my accusers? He said, don't worry, they are here. I've locked them up in a room because I know them. They will kill you in front of me. So I locked them up. Now I'm going to lock you and you, you three in another room, and then I'll bring them out and listen to their accusations, and then I'll send them out, and you will have to be brought out to defend yourself. I said, sure. And so we were in that room for over two hours. I have no idea what they were accusing us of. I discovered only one of them, that we as a church teach that Mary is not in heaven. She's still sleeping in the grave, and that's heresy to them because they worship Mary. So I came out, and you know what the governor said to me? These foolish, he used much stronger words, so I'll use the word foolish. These foolish priests have no idea what you Adventists believe. They accused you all kinds of lies, and I defended you. So you are a free man. And I said, thank you. One moment, he said, they're waiting for you out there to kill you. So I better send you out with a bodyguard. And the three of us were in the middle, and there were three soldiers on this side, three soldiers this side with revolvers. And as we walked out, they were shouting. And I said to the, the, my translator, what are they saying? Stone him! And I said, you know, too bad. <laughs> Stephen did not have a bodyguard. His time had come. So we walked through that crowd, folks, and nobody touched us. And after three weeks of the effort, and these students came all the, every night, the 70 students gave their hearts to Christ. <laughs> because their Orthodox Church is very legalistic. Yes, they were keeping the Sabbath, but in a very, just like the Jews, in order to be saved. And they heard the good news for the first time, and they said, thank you. So my hour had not yet what? Because I had to come to Washington State. Folks, if your hour has not yet come, nobody can what? Touch you. If your hour has come, what God is saying to you, it's time for you to go to sleep. And I'll wake you up when I come back. And you know, when you reach my age, it's wonderful to go to sleep. There is another lesson from this study, and it is this, that between the world and the church, Satan is able to unite because the world is broken up in all kinds of factions, ethnic factions, political factions, but when he wants to, he can unite the world together. Because we read in the Bible that all the world will follow him. Revelation 13, verse 3 and 4. In the days of Christ, there were two groups. The Romans and the Jews and there was no love in between them. The Jews hated the Romans, and vice versa. But do you know, at the cross, he united the two groups against a common enemy. One day, he will unite the world against the church. And you and I will have to face 
the time of trouble. Not because we are bad, but because we are Christians. We belong to the kingdom of heaven. Okay. The next thing I want you to notice, and you'll find this in Acts 3, you know, 14, 15. When the world has to choose between two people, between Christ, the Messiah, and the worst criminal in Pilate's jail called Barabbas, what did they do? When Pilate said, you can choose one of them to be freed. You know, these Jews never even told Pilate, we would like to have a committee meeting. Their response was instantaneous. Give us Barabbas. But he's a murderer, he's a criminal. Yes, but he's one of us. So what do you want me to do with Christ? Crucify him. So the world will go against you, not because you are bad, but because you belong to who? For Jesus said, if they hate you, it's because they hate me what? First. So my dear people, on the cross, the universe, the universe saw the true colors of Satan. And I hope this morning you have seen the true colors of Satan. Because one of these days, he's going to come to you as an angel of what? Light. Look at the cross. Because that's where he was exposed. He's a murderer of your savior. Have no sympathy with him. He will tell you a lot of lies. You know, he'll come to you and say, you know, your church has been teaching that the second coming of Christ is very soon. How soon is soon? It's over 150 years. You might as well give up. Remember, he's a what? Liar. Remember that to God, a thousand years is like what? One day. If you look at Hebrews, you know, chapter 10, it says that 2,000 years ago, Christ will come. He will not delay. He'll come soon. That's 2,000, but to God, it's only like two what? Days. So please remember, when he comes to you as an angel of light, remember, he's a liar, but above all, he's a murderer of your Savior. You know, we have an expression in English, misery loves what? He wants you to join him in the lake of fire. And in closing, I want you to notice something. In Matthew 25, Jesus, at the end of the world, will divide the human race in only two camps. Sheep and what? Goats. Do you know what he says to the sheep in Matthew 25, verse 31? Come, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from when? So your performance had nothing to do with it. But you accepted what he prepared for you. In verse 41, he speaks to the goats. Curse are you. Depart into what fire? Prepared for whom? Not for you. For the devil and his what? But you insisted in believing his lies and joining him. I will give you what you have chosen even though it's against my wishes, because I want none to perish. So please remember, keep your eyes focused on Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, and the joy was to see you in heaven with him. And that is my prayer in Jesus' name. Let us pray. Loving Father, thank you for exposing Satan. You had to do it because he kept in his heart his desire to murder Jesus right from the beginning. The only way you could accomplish what was hidden in his heart was to allow it to happen. And we thank you, Jesus, that you were willing to be mistreated, spat upon, and then crucified so that Satan's true colors may be exposed. May we never have any sympathy for the enemy of souls and the enemy of our Savior. Keep our eyes focused on your son Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. Bless us to this end, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.